So let's begin with prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Teach us your word. Guide us in your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. One day a young woman arose out of bed. It was early in the morning, and the chores had to be done. In her Nazareth home, her mother would be expecting her to help. She would be expecting her to help prepare breakfast, lay out the daily duties. She had a pile of clothes to mend, the house to clean, and a few animals to feed. And the day was cloudless, blue sky, and the sun was probably beginning to heat the day. And she knew that she was going to be married soon to a man named Joseph. And she knew him, but, but didn't really know him deeply. This was an arranged marriage for her. Well, Mary had grown up in a Jewish home, in a Jewish culture, Jewish rituals, and Jewish stories. Yet she lived in Nazareth, which was a rejected and mocked town. Many groups of people from all over Rome lived in Nazareth. There were many ethnic groups and languages that were heard and seen and spoken. And Nazareth really didn't provide much of an economic environment or an advantage. It was filled with carpenters and fishermen and merchants. If she thought about it, her world and her life were pretty much would revolve around her family in Nazareth, her home, and her future husband. She would simply live, become her mother and do what her mother had done. Yet in anticipation of the Messiah filled the air and it was talked about in the synagogue. And she probably thought the Messiah is going to be born soon. And she felt that because everyone was talking about it. And she probably thought, well, the, the person who's going to be chosen to give birth to the Messiah will probably live in Jerusalem. Well, her future was laid out. It was simple, difficult, oppressed, and routine. And then one day an angel appeared to her and visited Mary. Her future was no longer what she thought. And what she thought would be an obscure life would now be judged and mistaken. A judged and mistaken life. Her reputation was was sacrificed. Her life would become more difficult. Her destiny changed. Would she ever know an earthly reward for obeying God? Not really. And the script that she imagined her life to be would now, was now affected and changed, and not necessarily for the better. Stares and whispered conversations probably would follow her for the rest of her days. Well, several years later, on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, a man named Simon and his brother Andrew were hard at work casting nets on the Sea of Galilee, hoping for a big catch. And their friends and sometimes co-workers, the Zebedee brothers, James and John, were also on the boat casting their nets. And they were with their father. And this was their livelihood. This was what they had been doing for generations. Fishing. And if James and John, Simon and Andrew had been asked about the future, they would have said, you're looking at it. This is our future. We're fishermen. We've been doing this for generations. Then one day, they were visited by a man, a teacher, a rabbi. He didn't look like anything. He didn't look very impressive. He didn't appear to be anything special, but his message was powerful and his presence was inviting. In some strange way, these men were attracted to this man, his message, and his calling. Their life was interrupted. Their script changed. Their destiny transformed. They left their nets, their boats, their mending equipment, everything so they could follow this man. They left their future. These men would go on to turn the world upside down, as it says. They would preach the message, declare the name, and live out Christ's will. They would stand before councils and deny not their Lord. They would share with one another, love one another, and heal one another. Then they would die for their Lord, willingly, painfully, and in humility. Their script changed, their future changed. And destiny changed. A scholar by the name of Saul had grown up in a nobleman's home. In the city of Tarsus. He was well educated. He was a proud Jew. A proud Pharisee. A learned scribe. He dedicated and sold out for his cause. The teaching of the Torah. His God. His word and his law was his life. He surrendered himself to the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He surpassed all the other Pharisees in school. He memorized more scripture and he, gave, he even corrected the scribes. 
He was known and respected and he lived in Jerusalem. He gave counsel to the Sanhedrin and he taught in the synagogue. Then one day he heard a group of of men and women who were teaching about a Messiah. And And this group identified with the Jews. They were saying that the Messiah was crucified. Absolutely ridiculous, he thought. So he went after them. He arrested them. He imprisoned them. And he even had some killed. There's no way the Messiah, the God, the, the God's son, God's Messiah, God's anointed would be cursed by God. <clears throat> if you had asked him about his career, his future, his life, he would have said, I see my life as teaching in the synagogue, raising up future leaders and Pharisees. He would have been a strong advocate of the law, and he would have probably have carefully maintained the practice of the law. He would have married, probably served on the Sanhedrin. He was the rising star. And then one day, on his way to Damascus to arrest more followers of Christ, he was blinded by this cursed Messiah who visited him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I am the Lord you are persecuting. On that day, in that moment, his script changed. His future transformed. His destiny was different. He would no longer be the Pharisee training future Pharisees. He would no longer sit on the Sanhedrin practicing and teaching the law. He would now speak the message that would cause his fellow colleagues to first dismiss him and then threaten him. He would now face throughout his life Beatings, dangers, and struggles. He'd be laughed at and mocked. He would be vilified and hated. He would plant churches throughout the Roman world. Declaring the message of Christ. Proclaiming his name. And he would write 13 letters that would find their way in the New Testament. Well, what is your script? Has God changed your script? None of these men and Mary ever regretted serving and following God. They found someone so grand, so amazing, so powerful, so beautiful, so full of mercy and grace that all their energy, resources, and directions, was willing, they willingly gave it to him because he was worth it. God wants to change your script. He wants to change your direction, change your destiny. He wants to rewrite your future. He wants to transform your life. You will face challenges, roadblocks, insults, victories, joyful reunions, peaceful resolutions, and miracles of God. But through it all, God will be moving through your life. I want you to know today, Christ is your destiny. I got the beginning of a cold, so it's like, (laughs) feel it coming. Well, Christ is the new script. He's your new destiny. The transformed life, the interruption of what we seek and the journey that we may desire, He is it. He's the healing we need, the salvation we desire and the hope that we aspire to. He's the righteousness we crave and He is the path that leads to life. Christ. Christ is your destiny, meaning life is Meaning his life is our life. His words, our words. His love, our love. His father, our father. His journey, our journey. His obedience and calling, our calling and obedience. That is what makes us peculiar and odd, weird and strange to this world. We're aliens and strangers to this world because we have a destiny that leads us to the father. And our destiny is Christ and with Christ. Our destiny is our journey and our destiny is relationship with him. The Apostle Paul wrote the letter to the Romans, meaning he wrote the letter to the churches in the city of Rome. And Paul planted many churches throughout, and in many cities throughout the Roman Empire, but he never planted a church in Rome. This was not a, a letter that he was sending to people that he knew. Um, and so there's a few letters that he didn't write to, uh, to the churches he planted. Colossians is another one. But he didn't, write, he didn't plant these churches. Well, throughout his ministry, Paul faced stiff opposition from different teachers. And you can see some of that uh, bear out in his letters. For example, like in Galatians, there is some group of men who came in. They're called the Judaizers who says, you're not. Paul is not preaching the full gospel. 
He's not t- telling you about circumcision and the food laws and obeying the Sabbath. And so we need to correct what he's teaching. He's not teaching the whole gospel. And for example, in 2 Corinthians, teachers came into the Corinth churches and says, well, Paul's not a good guy. He's not a good speaker. He doesn't ask for enumeration or money, and that makes him a, a fraud. And so they challenged his character, and his message was rejected. And you can read about this. And sort of in 2 Corinthians, how he tells the, the Corinthian church, what are you doing not defending me? Well, he countered many challenges. So in his letter to the Romans, he wanted to clearly and theologically explain what he was preaching and backing it up with Scripture and showing that what he was saying is nothing new. That's all found in Scripture. That the message that he's preaching is wrapped up in, in what we call the Old Testament. And he starts, and he, he starts with sin in chapter uh, 1, 2, and 3. And he says, you're all sinners, even if you're a a synagogue-going Jew or a wretched pagan. Guess what? You're all the same. We're all sinners. Then he explains that it has always been by faith that we obtained righteousness. It's never been any other way. How did Abraham receive righteousness? By faith. He believed in God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. He then explains that by Christ we now have faith in him, and through him we receive his righteousness. And, and it's like he was saying, well, what about the law? The law. Well, that is, a, a, that is righteousness. But you will, never able, you will never be able to fulfill that. It can only expose our sin. It can never make us righteous. And so when I put my faith in Christ, guess what? I have attained it all. I, I have fulfilled the law because of Christ. And so when we come to Romans 8, verse 1, it says this, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. There is now no condemnation. We do not have the ability, we do not have the intelligence, and we do not have the will, uh, willpower to make ourselves righteous. We cannot remove the condemnation sticker That's placed on our nature. (laughs) Only Christ is that removed. Only in Christ am I set free. First point. Recognize you are powerless. Now we don't like to hear that word I guess. Let's look at Romans 8. Let's look at verse 1 again. Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus the law of the spirit of life set me free. From the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do and that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin and sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their mind set on what the nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their mind set on what the spirit desires. The mind of the sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. We are powerless to our situation, as this passage so clearly points out. Now, a lot of times we delude ourselves into thinking that we're not powerless. And as people, we're not. We can do a lot of things. I mean, we build, we create, we invent, we discover, and we think deeply. We write about our musings. We expand our world. And we engage with the unknown. In July of 1969, using 1960 technology, we sent men to the moon to walk on it. With computers that were be considered worthless today. I mean, you have better computers on your phone now (laughs) compared to that. And so we patted ourselves on the back. We spent billions of dollars to do this so man could walk on the moon. And in the last 50 years, we had advanced technologically in such, by leaps and bounds in communication and travel and exploration and science and discovery. We're more open to diverse ideas and communities around the world. 
We're taking a stronger stance against poverty and finding ways to solve world problems. However, there's one thing we cannot and will not be able to do. We cannot overcome the sinful human nature. We're powerless to its enticements and to its will. We cannot say no to the sinful human nature. Our nature is relentlessly pushing us away from God, not toward him. God gave his people the law, but the law only exasperated our sin. It only exposed us that we're sinners. The law has no power. It's, for example, like uh, the law is like a mirror. And if you have a dirty face, all it can show you is you got dirt on your face. You don't use the law to wash your face or the mirror. It's like this. I can I would at sometimes play basketball. Rick Schuler, where are you? Yeah, used to play with him. But the NBA is not going to call me up and say, hey, why don't you come and play for us? Unless maybe I'm with the Kings or something, Sacramento Kings or something like that. No, I'm just kidding. But they're not going to call me out. Why? Because I don't, I, w- I don't even have any kind of talent that would be equivalent to that. Someone would have to give me their talent to be able to play at that level. And the same is true here is what Romans 8 is saying. The only way you could ever stand in the presence of God and attain that righteousness is if Christ gave you that righteousness. So God sent his son to condemn sin and he took on our human nature and he condemned human nature. He defeated human nature. He made human nature powerless to sin so we could walk in the righteousness of God. And Christ fulfilled the law in all its perfection. And now by faith in him, I'm made righteous. By faith in Christ, I have fulfilled the law. The control of the sinful nature now is no longer there. The sinful nature has died. Christ changed my destiny, changed my powerlessness to sin to powerlessness to righteousness. I kind of think of it that way. He changed my destiny. First observation, righteousness is our greatest need. Now, there's something we do not understand is that why is how do we understand righteousness from day to day? This is our greatest need. In Matthew 5, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. We hunger for a lot of things and we pursue a lot of things, and those things that we pursue do not give us the satisfaction that we desire and that we crave. In John 6, Jesus said to the crowd, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus said to the woman at the well, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Later on in John 6, Jesus said, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. You know, as I read these verses that Jesus is saying, he is declaring and he's making very clear that he is our greatest need. He is our righteousness, that we are to pursue him, not what our bodies crave. Our bodies crave things that try to replace Christ. They take us in directions away from Christ. And we try to fulfill our heart and mind with things that will never give us what Christ can. What we crave will never give us what we need or even what we want. But in Christ, we have everything. You know, as I examine this passage in Romans 8, I see that there's like these two roads That we follow two goals to pursue. I can pursue what my nature, my sinful human nature desires, and it leads to death. Or I can pursue what the spirit desires, and I'll find life and peace. You see, my desires always fall short of what God has given me. They mask Christ with many things and say, you don't need Christ. You can have this instead. But I will never get that living water, that bread of heaven. Until I come to him. Our need is righteousness, but we pursue everything but righteousness. And in this passage, Paul clearly shows that our sinful nature is hostile to God. It's hostile to God. And we don't submit to God's law. It's rebellious against God. People are rebellious toward him. And if we think of it, we are rebellious toward him. Until God comes crashing into your life. 
invading your life. Then you will see your need. A man like Paul who thought his life was good, he was doing good things, God invaded and challenged his life. He showed him, your righteousness, Paul, is not good. It has to come from me instead. And he showed him God, he showed him God's direction and God's will. And God is not asking you to please him. He's asking you to submit to him. And that, in that sense, you will please him. The powerlessness that we have toward God is removed in Christ. The stubborn heart and the rebellious life is subdued because Christ is is your destiny. Second point, remember your new nature. Remember your new nature. Let's look at verse 9. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin. Yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it's not to the sinful nature, to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For God did not receive a spirit that... For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we're God's children. Now, if we're children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and cars with Christ. Indeed, if we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Such beautiful words. You know, after Christ ascended to heaven in Acts chapter 1, he sent the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. And it was a spirit-filled church. It was a spirit-empowered church. When you look at the church and how it acted and lived, the people loved each other. They took care of each other. They taught. They were united under the teaching of Christ. They were united in blessing and encouraging each other. They weren't concerned with their individual needs. They were concerned with each other's needs. They were not concerned with themselves, but with each other because Christ had invaded their heart. As a result, people were attracted to that and thousands came in. And a follower of Christ who seeks the Holy Spirit because we are people who are engaged with the Holy Spirit, given to us by Christ. Christ gave us the Holy Spirit. And through that, He is the key to knowing God and knowing ourselves. Because of the Holy Spirit, He makes you alive to God, verse 10. He demonstrates that you belong to God, verses 9 and 16. What demonstrates that you have the Holy Spirit And a lot of times there's a controversy. How do you know you have the Holy Spirit? It's because you love. You have the same love that Christ has. If you read 1 Corinthians 13, you read Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit, you see that love is the hallmark. It's the identifying mark of the Holy Spirit in your life. It's love. Number one, live according to the Spirit. In verse 11, Paul reminds us of our new nature and the ability we now have because of the Spirit. Christ rose from the dead. And from what I know, death is something we cannot stop. If someone dies, I don't, you know, nobody goes up and says, oh, look, they're they're alive three days later or four days later. They're dead. I don't know of any power in the universe that can make a dead person come to life. But the Holy Spirit has that power. What power in the universe has something to can stop death? And look at verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. Yet the, it's the Holy Spirit who raised Christ from the dead, who has resurrection power, who's living in you. And when you have the Holy Spirit living in you, who has resurrection power, that means no chain of sin, no slavery of addiction, or no power of human desire can stop you and keep you and hold on to you from following God. You now have the power of the Spirit who raised Christ from the dead living in you, overcoming whatever obstacles stand in your way. And when you live according to the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, of the flesh, and you live life to the fullest. 
You are taken into the presence of God. You're called His son, His child. You're no longer enslaved to fear. You no longer face judgment and condemnation. You're taken into the presence of God. And you know Him as Daddy Father. Abba Father, Daddy. A term of endearment. You know Him deeply and intimately. You are an heir of God and a core of Christ. Do you imagine that, what that means? That when God sees you, He sees you just like Christ. A co-heir of Christ. Whatever Christ has, you have. When Jesus was in the desert, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights and he was hungry. I don't know why they put that in there. (laughs) I'd be hungry after one meal myself. But 40 days and 40 nights. And on the 40th day, the devil came to visit him. And he took him to a pile of rocks and he says, If you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And one thing is, uh, that is certain about people, as, uh, for all of us, is we have to eat. Now, people have done 40-day fasts, but they eventually have to eat, or we will die. We have to eat. And when, uh, you know, and when people who are in a poverty situation, food is so important that that's all that matters to them. And Jesus is walking among a people, a majority of people who are in poverty situations. And in this way, he's demonstrating that poverty and that great need. But Jesus, when he's facing this this tempter, the devil, he doesn't respond to the devil um, that points to his human desire and need for food. He responds to the devil in a way that says, I have something greater I'm living for. In verse 4, he says, "Man does, as it is written, it, man does not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And this is what he's trying to teach everybody, people who are in poverty situations, who are destitute. He is saying, if you ponder this, what he's saying, he says, you were created for so much more than just your physical needs. We have a destiny far greater than we can ask or imagine. If you think of it, the majority of the decisions that we make from day to day are based on our human need. And we were created for something so much more grand than that. You know, as I read Romans 8, I see that I was created and you are created for so much more than just what our human desires are. I want you to know Christ is your destiny. Number three, rejoice in your new destiny. Start with verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Again, beautiful words. You know, John Maxwell tells of a story Uh, about a a small town in Maine that was proposed for the site of a great hydroelectric um, plant. A dam would be built across the river and the town would be submerged. And when the project was announced, the people were given many months to arrange their affairs and then move on and relocate. Well, during those months, a curious thing began to take place. All improvements ceased, obviously. No painting was done. No repairs were made on the buildings, roads, or sidewalks. Day by day, the whole town got shabbier and shabbier, long, long before the waters would ever come and submerge the town. 
It, the town looked uncared for and, un, and abandoned, even though people had not yet moved away. And one citizen explained, where there's no faith in the future, there's no power in the present. The town was cursed with hopelessness because it had no future. In the, in the book of Proverbs 24, we read, For though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. There is hope. Our destiny is one of certainty and truth. That is why we have hope. As Paul continues on in his teaching in Romans 8, he tells the identity that we have in Christ and the reality of who we are because of Christ and the future that awaits us. Yet there is this present evil age that wages war against us. This world, this creation is cursed by sin. And because of that, this whole creation groans. And this curse of this creation is subjected to futility, vanity, and meaninglessness. And what this means is that this creation was created with a purpose, and this creation cannot fulfill its purpose because it's cursed by our human sin. And so this creation suffers as a result of our sin. This world suffers under the weight of sin, and only the redemption of humanity through Christ can creation know the purpose for which it is created. What we see is that the creation is in a hopeless cycle. And we feel it as people. We see and we wonder about the bondage to decay, the futility of life, the cycle of routine that doesn't change. Why am I here? (laughs) We ask. What does the future hold? We live day to day, and for what purpose? Now, if you take God out of that answer, then you have truly reached hopelessness. First observation, Christ came to redeem you. The hope is not found in creation, but in Christ. He redeemed us, and we long, and he longs for us to receive him so that we can receive our new bodies. We desire for liberation. We know that this evil age will bring suffering, but our future is so much greater that we may suffer today, but it cannot compare with the glorious uh, beauty of, of what we will enjoy with him. So we may suffer and we may struggle and we may endure hardship today, but it will never compare with what we know when we stand before God, our Savior. And finally, God seeks to conform you. You know, as we live in this evil age, we can get caught up in the struggles of each day and forget the destiny that God has designed. You can get caught up with the problems and focus so much on those, you forget the destiny that God has given you. And because of that, through our weakness, we will pray for something that is not grand enough. We will have weak prayers. And it's interesting in Romans 8, 26, when we don't know how to pray, the Spirit will pray for us. He'll intercede for us. He'll give us words so He will teach us how to pray because we will have weak prayers. I remember reading this past week, Exodus 5, where Moses goes to Pharaoh and tells him, the Lord has spoken, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, I don't know this God. Of course, God will introduce himself to him. So he denies the request. And he says, no, in fact, you know what? I'm going to take your straw away. And you still have to make the same number of bricks each day, but you have to go find your own straw. Well, the four men get mad at Moses, and Moses gets mad at God. You made our lives bitter and horrible, and the Pharaoh hates us even more. He already hates you. And your lives are already bitter and horrible. And as I read this, I realize that no matter how harsh Pharaoh acts at this moment, he will only have a moment because God's will cannot be stopped. But it is that moment that we struggle. Do you realize that? It's in that moment that we struggle and we can't see past our future that that has been destined to us by a human being. And we get caught up in that moment and we begin to pray weak prayers. Because I guarantee you, those Israelites, you know what they prayed for? More straw. Because I would have prayed for that. And God is saying, I have something so much more grand than more straw. You don't need more straw. You need freedom. You need rescue. You need holiness. You need righteousness. You need me. That's what he's saying. 
Our prayers are weak in that we pray in the moment the enemy has and we forget the destiny that we have been given. Sometimes we pray for straw when God has given us freedom. So God shows us how to pray and then he conforms us into the likeness of his son and we realize that was just a moment the enemy had. And that's all he gets. Do you realize the spirit is interceding for you right now? That means he's speaking to you, to the father about you. And, and in that speaking to the Father, he's working out all things for the good. And he is conforming you into the image of Christ. There's our prayer. Lord, conform me into the image of Christ in this moment. And in the next moment. And in the next moment. Because that's all the enemy's got is a moment. I got a future and I got a destiny. You know, a man approached a little league baseball game one afternoon. He asked the boy in the dugout, what was the score? It's 18 nothing. We're behind. Well, I bet you're discouraged. Why should I be discouraged, said the boy? We haven't gone up to bat yet. <laughs> our turn to bat is coming up because Christ is our destiny. Let's pray. Father, you are good and holy, awesome and true. Teach us to pray, O Lord. Teach us to seek your will and to understand our destiny. Show us your truth. We love you and praise you for the cross. We love you and praise you for the empty grave. We love you and praise you for the spirit that you've given us. And Lord, that we would not rely on you, or rely on ourselves, but rely on you. Not rely on our strength or our wisdom or intellect, but rely on you and your word. Your word is truth. Oh, thank you, Lord.